Hi, so we can get started. There'll probably be people coming along um, as we're going. Um, I just want to introduce the topic. This is zoning demystified. And um, the idea for this came from a um, bunch of conversations I've had with people where they admitted that they found zoning really confusing. <laughs> um, they know that there's controversy. Um, they're often in meetings where people know a lot about zoning. And um, and they feel that they just don't have the background. And so I thought uh, it would be important to uh, connect to some people who knew a lot and to um, see what we can learn tonight. We won't learn everything about zoning. It's a very complicated process, but, um, but we'll try to get our the beginning of it. Uh, so I just wanna talk about the, um, the agenda. Um, couple more minutes for the ground rules and introduction. Um, so this is a informational se session. There's lots and lots of opportunity uh, now and in the future to talk about uh, your views on the warrant articles and zoning changes or not, not changes in particular. Um, this is really an opportunity for us to learn um, about zoning and get some pretty basic questions answered. So we are going to be, um, there isn't going to be conversation, but we are going to be answering questions that people are raising. So if you have a question, you can put it into the chat at any point and we will be collecting them and answering them at the end. So, so what we're trying to do is get real, real questions like, you know, I'm confused about this, or I don't know the difference between this and this, uh, rather than sort of more discussion, which is really an, an important thing to do, but, it, but we do have other opportunities for that. Um, so uh, then we're going to go into an introduction and overview about what zoning is, what it does for us, what it doesn't do for us, a little bit of the history. Um, that's going to be done by Laura Wiener and Amy Dane. I'm going to talk about the participants very shortly. Uh, then uh, sort of a, a bunch of maps, many of you probably have seen them, of the um, Arlington's land use policies, their zoning maps. Um, and uh, that's going to be presented by Jenny Raitt and Rachel Zembury. Then a, Alex Bagnell and Steve Revelak are going to do a stroll down Mass Ave, which is just sort of looking at different buildings in Mass Ave that we're familiar with and talking about um, the zoning restrictions and to what extent is conforming or not conforming. Uh, then lots and lots of time for questions. And I'm sure if we need you know, five minutes more, we can do that. So let me introduce the people. Uh, so they're by alphabetical order. Alex Bagnell is a town meeting member from Precinct 9. Um, he's a member of Envision Arlington Standing Committee and also the Remote Participation Study Group. Um, and he is going to be involved in the Stroll Down Mass Ave. Amy Dane is an outside consultant. We're really lucky to have her. Um, she has done tons of work in the, in the last bunch of years um, on public policy research and specifically about zoning and multifamily. Um, and accessory dwelling units. And, um, and her work is, uh, yeah, there's a lot, but it's really easy to understand. It's really well-written and I, I enjoy it. Um, Jennifer Raid, um, I'm sure many of you know, is Director of Planning and Community Development for the Town of Arlington. Um, and we're thankful to have her here. Steve Revelek is a member of the Zoning Recodification Working Group and the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, he was also a member of um, the uh, ZBA, uh, prior and he's a town meeting member of Precinct 1. Laura Wiener is an urban planner. She's worked for the town of Arlington uh, and the city of Watertown and she's on the board of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. She and Amy are going to be presenting sort of the introduction, big overview of what, what is zoning. And Rachel Zembray, I'm sure many people know as well, is the chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. And so that is the end of my introduction and I'm going to turn it over to Amy and to Laura. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming on behalf of Envision Arlington. Welcome to tonight's forum on zoning. <clears throat> zoning isn't easy. It can be hard to read, hard to understand, and hard to visualize how the words on the page look when implemented to build. Tonight, I'm going to introduce some concepts and some vocabulary related to zoning. Zoning divides a town into zones or districts and then establishes regulations and standards for each district. There are two kinds of standards, uses and dimensions. Uses first, zoning determines what uses can go where, which explains why we have neighborhoods that are primarily residential and areas that are primarily commercial. 
Early zoning was first established in the early 1900s to separate the noxious industrial uses from residential uses. There are three general use categories, residential uses, both single family and multifamily, i.e. apartment buildings, commercial uses, meaning retail restaurants and offices, and industrial uses, generally where things are made. And that category includes research and development, such as lab buildings, most vehicular uses, auto body and auto repair, breweries and distilleries, and other types of manufacturing. If a use is not allowed in a district, that is a final no. There's no appealing it, no variances or special permits to allow a use that is not allowed. The only exception is that 40 um, is for a 40B comprehensive permit that allows residential in any zone with the inclusion of affordable housing. And you'll be hearing more about that later. <clears throat> However, there are also uses that are allowed only by special permit. That means that in order to open a restaurant, you must be in a commercial zone. And in most cases, you will need to apply to one of the town's two boards, either the ARB or the ZBA for a special permit where your plans will be reviewed according to set criteria. So it's an allowed use with review. The alternative is called by right or as of right, which means only, only a building permit is required, no review by any special boards. The second set of standards is called dimensional standards. And this includes height, setbacks, meaning the number of feet from each lot line that can be built upon, frontage, which is the minimum width of the property along the street, and the minimum size of a lot that can be built on. In most residential areas, the minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet. Dimensional standards also include parking requirements, and these standards taken together determine how large a, a building can be based on the lot it is built on. An owner can apply to appeal one of these standards, and that is called a variance. Variance, variances go to the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and are reviewed by a strict set of standards. It is much harder to get a variance than a special permit because variances are for things that are not allowed, whereas special permits are for things that are allowed, but with a public review. Just about every year, there are zoning changes proposed for the town meeting warrant. Times change, uses change, technology changes, and the law changes. One example of this is that the environmental movement has resulted in new requirements for energy conservation, wetlands protection, bike accommodation, and general sustainability in building practices. I've tried to lay out a framework for understanding what zoning is and how it works and introduce some zoning vocabulary. It's complicated and full of exceptions, so don't feel stupid asking questions either here or at any town meeting. The next speaker is Amy Dane, who will talk about the evolution of zoning, particularly in the suburban setting. Hi, thank you, uh, Laura and Jennifer and Envision Arlington for the opportunity to present. I'm going to share my screen and do a PowerPoint. Um, and I would recommend if anyone's just listening, you might wanna look at the screen because it'll be hard to understand without the visuals. Yeah. Okay. So zoning often looks like hundreds of pages of this. It can seem impenetrable, but in truth, actually, it can get tied up in a lot of knots, but a lot of it's also easy to understand. And today I'm going to unpackage some basics. Here's a quick agenda for my talk. I'm gonna be talking about zones and districts, uses allowed, dimensional requirements, by rate zoning, special permits, legislative approval of projects, overlay districts, 40B, pre-existing non-conforming buildings and value capture. Don't let me lose you now, I haven't started yet. This should go too, um, shouldn't be too hard. Item one, zoning divides a town into zones or districts. Arlington, you have a lot of zones. Each different color here is a different zone. Zoning maps come with legends. So you see here on the left, R districts are for residences, B districts are for businesses, and I district is for industry. 
Here's another zoning map just as an example. This one's Hamilton, Massachusetts, a smaller town. It has fewer districts. See the legend, there are R&B districts. Almost the whole town in <laughs> Hamilton um, is zoned for single family houses. There's a zone for single family houses on half acre lots, a zone for single family houses on one acre lots, and a zone for single family houses on two acre lots. And then there's that little purple spot towards the bottom. It's very small, that's the business district. Here's a neighborhood built to the zoning in Hamilton. Next up, I'm gonna talk about uses. Uh, this year is a table of uses in Arlington. Um, most zoning ordinances and bylaws um, have tables of uses and just FYI, bylaws are for towns and ordinances are what you have in cities. Um, what is a use? A house is a use. The column on the left lists possible residential uses. So single family detached dwellings, three family dwellings, apartment buildings, group homes, etc. See the dark blue ribbon uh, at the top? It lists the residential districts, R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7. These correspond with the zones on the map. Then see the arrow at the top that I put there points to single family homes. The chart shows they are allowed in each residential district. That's the yes, the Y is for yes. And then in the second and third arrows, I'm pointing at three family dwellings and apartment buildings. They're allowed in certain districts. The SP indicates special permit is needed. I'm gonna explain what special permits are later. I'll loop back to it. Next up is dimensional requirements. Um, most zoning bylaws and ordinances have tables of dimensional requirements. They vary, the requirements vary by zoning district. Here we usually find minimum lot area, minimum frontage, also setbacks, sometimes parking requirements are in the chart, sometimes in a different section. Um, and those are requirements for each use allowed in each district. By right zoning. In the early days of zoning, say from the 1920s through the 1950s, most development was happening through as of right zoning. What is as of right zoning? It's also called by right zoning. This is predictable, non-discretionary zoning. Here's how it works. Imagine you own an acre of land. The land fronts a public road. The zoning says single family houses are allowed on one acre lots. You read the zoning, you know you can build a house on your land, it's your right. The building inspector does not have discretion to deny you a permit to build on that one acre lot if your lot and plan meets all the specified requirements. Note that a town can't simply zone private property um, as open space or prohibit all economically viable uses without compensating the landowners. It would be a taking. Also, the law in general needs to be predictable. So for those reasons, as I understand it, something economically viable should be allowed as of right, predictably, on all privately owned unrestricted land. In practice, that something is most often single family houses on relatively large lots. Uh, large is relative to where, where your community is. In Greater Boston, the as of right zoning is fully built out to the capacity allowed in really most places. In Arlington's table of uses, we see the Y for yes, means single family detached dwellings are allowed as of right in every residential district. You can see there are no districts where every use is um, by special permit. So you know that by looking at, like if you pick the district RO and look down like a column, you'll see a, a Y and SP, a Y and SP, the special permit, the yes is by right. But if you look down for every district, something is going to be allowed as of right. Special permits are then scaffolded on top of as of right predictable zoning. Special permits are, dis, uh, are a discretionary zoning system. The zoning law, bylaw or ordinance designates the planning board or zoning board of appeals or city council as the special permit granting authority. Um, I understand in Arlington, it's the um, ARB or the zoning board of appeals um, are special permit granting authorities. Now the landowner is not only going to the building inspector for a permit, but has to get approval from the special permit granting authority if, if the use that they're getting permitted for it requires a special permit. 
With a special permit, there's no guarantee of approval, even if the project appears to meet all of the zoning specifications. So if you want to build a three family house in Arlington in a district where three family houses are allowed, I have a, like circled the districts there, you can look up R3, R4, R5, uh, you would have to apply for a discretionary permit. According to my research, most multifamily housing projects across Greater Boston have needed to get special permits. About 60% of multifamily units got special permits from 2015 to 2017. Note that for small scale developers, for startup developers, the lack of predictability can make it impossible to operate in Massachusetts. It's hard to get um, to build a business plan for small scale development around special permits. It's hard to get loans for risky undertakings. Over the decades, the local zoning approval processes have been getting less predictable, more discretionary, and more political. The recent trend is not only to move from by right zoning towards special permit um, zoning, but is towards also legislative approval of projects. So the landowner developer is not only going to the building inspector for non-discretionary permits or to the special permit granting authority for discretionary permits, but often has to get approval from city council or town meeting for the specific project. So here's Lexington zoning map as an example of this, of the legislative approval of projects. Uh, the yellow and peach, they both look, I think, light pink here. Uh, but the big zones, the, bi the biggest zones here are single family districts. The red ones are commercial districts. And there's a little strip in like a dark yellow uh, that's like, yeah, very small. That's the two family district. In 2013, Lexington voted to take the multifamily housing off the map and handle it through something called floating zoning. So the multifamily district floats over the entire town. The multifamily district is not mapped, but town meeting can pin the district down to specific parcels by approving projects. So this project with 30 units in Lexington got deliberated at two town meetings before it got approval and it was built. Another big term in zoning right now is overlay district. Here's an example in Bedford, Massachusetts, if your vision is good. Overlay districts can cover part of existing zones or cross zones. The underlying zones and rules generally stay in place. Um, sometimes the overlay rules um, uh, supersede that, but um, in general, the, you could do um, overlay districts or offer developers an opportunity to either use the rules in the overlay or to go by the rules in the underlying district. Um, overlay districts can be used for different purposes. Um, in the case of multifamily, they're often used for allowing more housing in certain areas. So the developer might choose to build under the overlay rules if they want to build more than what they could do otherwise. Um, this is often an easier surgical way to relax zoning for the town than by changing the base zoning. Um, it's not necessarily the one way isn't necessarily better than the other, but it's just frequently used because it's just kind of convenient to pick your overlay and come up with those rules and not go back into the bylaw and change everything. 40 B. In 1969, before I was born, the Massachusetts legislature determined that cities and towns in 1969 were over restricting multifamily housing via local zoning. It adopted a law called 40B, a mechanism for getting around local zoning for certain projects. First, 40B requires each city and town uh, to make sure that 10% of the homes, townwide or citywide, are deed restricted as affordable to low and moderate income households. In the cities and towns that have not yet met that goal, 10%, a developer can get a 40B permit called a comprehensive permit to build multifamily housing not allowed by local zoning. At least 20% of the homes in a 40B development must be deed restricted as affordable and sold and rented at affordable prices. Next topic is pre-existing non-conforming buildings. You might live in one. In Belmont's general residence district, single family houses are allowed by right. And two family houses are allowed by special permit. Three family houses are not allowed. The zoning says that you need a minimum of 5,000 square feet of land to build a single family house. And you need a minimum of 7,000 square feet to build a two family house. 
Now, if you see these two family houses in the picture, that's from that district. Um, and those two family houses are on lots that are 4,500 square feet. They're really not big enough for a single family or a two family house in the district. Most of the district is built out with two family houses on such small lots. They were built between 1915 and 1925, I think, before zoning, I assume, and they're pre-existing non-conforming houses. And we can zoom out to see that area of Belmont. This is near Waverly Square. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little bit of Watertown in there. Nobody's building subdivisions here. It's already subdivided more densely than the zoning would allow if it were a big meadow getting subdivided for the first time. The zoning does not allow incremental increases in density. In theory, a single family house on a lot of 7,000 square feet could be converted to a two family house. That would be like an incremental increase in density um, by special permit that in theory is allowed. But the single family houses in the district are a lot smaller than that. Greater Boston is largely built out to a greater capacity actually than allowed in the zoning by right. So to build anything either incrementally or significantly denser, Builders need to apply for discretionary permits in most places, or sometimes they need to undertake a very political process of getting project approval from town meeting or city council, like the case I told you about in Lexington. But in most neighborhoods, building incrementally or significantly denser is prohibited altogether. What it all has added up to for the entire region is a housing shortage. It's estimated that the region needs hundreds of thousands of more homes to meet demand for housing. The shortage means we have escalating prices, budgetary stress on households, housing instability, and homelessness. And one last topic that's wonky before I get to my conclusion. Um, the escalating prices mean that in some case, cases, in some places, especially the most affluent suburbs like Newton where I live and Wellesley or Weston, new houses sell for more than the cost of construction. And the cost of construction is very high right now. Sales prices are even higher in certain places. Through the regulatory process, municipalities sometimes capture some or all of that value, the delta between the construction cost and the sales price or rents. Value capture happens in so many different ways. Sometimes it's codified as a part of by right zoning or negotiated as a part of a special permit or negotiated through the legislative approval process. Sometimes value capture is done illegally. There are ways to do it legally and ways to do it illegally. Um, sometimes, so it is done legally. Captured value can go towards designation of affordable dwelling units and projects via inclusionary zoning, or it could involve the commitment of funds from the developer for art installations like public art or infrastructure upgrades or other municipal priorities. It could involve an upgrade of facade materials um, to have a better looking building for the public to enjoy. It could involve building of a bike lane or a bus shelter. It could involve setting up a shuttle system. Um, we had one of those um, negotiated with a project in Newton uh, that hasn't been built yet, but was approved. Value capture is highly controversial. It drives up the price of development, which will make some or many projects unviable. Uh, so it's tricky to implement, um, but it's also a pragmatic way to accomplish some things people care a lot about. So that's just an item to think about that zoning is used for it. Really tricky area, really interesting policy area. So now to my conclusion, I'll conclude with a little story, an anecdote. Um, here's my favorite storybook from childhood, The Little House. Um, maybe you've read it. Once upon a time, there was a little house way out in the country. And this is what happened. <laughs> Do you see the sad house? Manhattan swallowed it. Which reminds me of an article I read in the Boston Globe in 2005 when I was working on my first zoning study. It was about a proposed 56 um, unit senior housing complex in Carlisle. And in the article, a Carlisle resident was quoted to us, this is Manhattan come to Carlisle. Mm -hmm. Eight years later, eight years, in 2013, the complex finally got permitted and built with 26 units as a red barn. 
It was Carlisle's first rental development in 30 years. In fighting this imagined risk, we have created other problems at this kind of scale. And our region's been experiencing population pro pro pressures, not for the first time. So Wayland's 1962 master plan says, as population pressure has heightened, the planning board and the town meeting have reappraised Wayland's position within the Western section of the metropolitan area and have increased the lot area and frontage requirements for residential districts and maintain the single family residence requirement. So Wayland's saying we have more people who want to move here. So we're gonna reduce our ability to build more housing. The response to population pressure in cities and towns across the region to down zone, to use zoning to stop diverse growth, to use zoning to delay projects for years, leaves us with a housing shortage. So I think our task is to revise zoning to allow for some homes to be built in some places so that all people can have homes and housing stability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. That was a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, our next speakers are um, represent the ARB and the planning board, Rachel Zembry and Jennifer Rape. Great. Thank you very much. I'm Rachel Zembry. Um, I'm the chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, and Jenny and I, Jenny Rate, who's the director of planning and community development, uh, she and I are going to take you through the Arlington zoning maps and districts. So this is going to be just a really high level overview of how our, um, all of the different parcels in our town are divided and, um, and grouped via, via different zones. Um, these, if you go to the next page, please, um, you can see here, this is, this is the, uh, the ground area of our, our town with all of our streets overlaid. Um, and what we, uh, what we look at when we look at the zoning map are how each one of these different parcels are uh, interconnected together through uh, their classification into, into either residential, business, or industrial zones, um, or in some cases, uh, special overlay districts, as Amy mentioned before. The next slide. Um, so again, uh, the, as I just mentioned, these are, these are the parcels. Uh, the other items that are uh, classified on our zoning maps are the water and open space that we, uh, that we enjoy here in our town. So the first, uh, the first group of, uh, of uh, zoning districts that I'd like to cover are the residential zoning districts. Um, I'll say that both the residential, well, all of the different zoning districts, um, what you see here in the map um, is meant to be used together with the, um, together with the zoning use tables, which identifies um, further what specific uses are allowed um, without a uh, special hearing through either the redevelopment board or the zoning board of appeals. Uh, so what can be built as of right and what can be built uh, with additional approval within town and what can't be built at all in those individual districts. So our, uh, three, uh, our, our three of the R districts, our zero, our one and our two, and we'll start here with our zero, are our um, residential districts that are primarily single family um, and two family uh, districts. So R0 is the large lot single family districts. These are uh, generally served by local streets and um, typically uh, single family homes. If we go to R1, uh, this is the single family district. And as you can see, it takes up a significant portion of the land we have here in Arlington. Again, these are primarily single family um, dwellings in our public lands and uh, buildings. So many of our schools, much of our open space um, is also within this, within this district. We go to the R2. Thank you. Uh, the R2 district is the two-family district. So again, um, predominantly two-family uh, homes or duplexes. There are also quite a few uh, single-family homes. These are uh, served by local streets, but they're largely walkable to some of our major corridors, such as Mass Ave and Broadway. Um, and these are, again, very pedestrian oriented and a little bit denser neighborhoods than our R1 and our R0 neighborhoods. Next slide. So um, the next 
two districts are, are um, two of our multifamily districts. The R3 is the three family district, uh, although there are very limited parcels, as you can see here, devoted to the R3 district. And I'll talk a little bit more about why some of these districts are so disconnected um, as we get through this. If you could go to the next slide. The R4 is the townhouse district. So um, these are typically uh, conversions of older homes into apartments um, and townhouse construction that allows for a bit more density within these districts. Next slide. Um, the next three districts are our apartment districts in town. So the R5 districts are, excuse me, R5 district is our low density apartment district. The next one, please. R6, which is our medium density apartment district. So these are apartments of up to four stories high and offices at a smaller scale. Um, and R7 is our high density apartment district. So these are apartments of up to five stories high. If you can go to the next slide. So you can see, as I mentioned, the R0, R1, and R2 districts, which are our uh, single family and two family homes and duplexes, take up the majority of the land we have here in Arlington. Next slide, please. Um, and the R3 through R7, our multifamily districts, tend to uh, be, again, along our major, uh, major corridors within the town. So these are all of our residential districts together. So next we'll move to our business districts. So these govern where we are able to um, locate businesses in town. Um, the first is the B1 neighborhood office district, which really encourages small scale uses. There are also a mix of one and two family homes within this, uh, within this district and uh, small scale mixed use without retail. So mixed use with offices typically on the ground floor. The B2 neighborhood districts, very widely distributed within town, um, is the neighborhood business district. So this uh, neighborhood business district is small scale retail and service. Uh, so this is primarily along Mass Ave and Broadway, as you can see. Our next business district is the B2A, which is major business districts. So these tend to be um, residential and service areas that serve a larger neighborhood. Um, so where the B2 district may be oriented more <laughs> toward walkability, these are really for car oriented <coughs> developments. So these have a little bit higher uh, density than the mixed use you might find in the B1 or B2. So the B3 are our village business districts. So these are pedestrian oriented. Um, really, most of us would know these as the Arlington Heights or, um, or the um, East Arlington Capital Square Business District. Um, and then there is a smattering as well um, near the center. The next is our vehicular oriented business district, B4. So these are larger parcels of land that are uh, vehicle oriented. Um, some of our uh, automotive sales and automotive repair um, uses are in the B4 district, although the town in the uh, zoning bylaws has identified that a conversion to other uh, retail or service or restaurant uses is desired in the future. Um, and the B5 district is our central business district. So this is the small area of, um, of Arlington Center that when combined with the B3 uh, parcels makes up the, the total of, of Arlington Center. So if we look at what the business districts in the next slide look like together, um, you might think this looks a bit like Swiss cheese <laughs> and a bit chaotic, and um, there's not a lot of consistency. So one of the things that we're currently looking at is how to bring some continuity to these business districts. Um, the way that this map was developed was back in the 70s um, when we had a, uh, a very different approach to zoning it was, uh, there was a, an effort called down zoning. So what uh, the town did is they looked at what type of building was on each lot and they basically created a, um, a zoning district and, and a, a zoning designation for that parcel for basically what was, what was there. So that's where we get some of the um, loss of continuity that we currently have in our business districts. 
Um, and it is a, a goal of the, the redevelopment board to uh, take a look at these business districts and see if there might be some opportunity to, um, to reintroduce some of the, the continuity that we're currently lacking. And I'll turn it over to Jenny. Thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna talk about the other districts and this will be short um, because there aren't that many other districts. The first one is the industrial district, um, which is you know, also very small, uh, relatively speaking. And even though it's called the industrial district, it actually does not have that much industrial use space um, as we realized after doing an economic analysis of the industrial zoning districts last year. Um, so the industrial district is intended for manufacturing, assembly uses, flexible office space, light industrial, um, and you can also have mixed use. Um, we had an, initially that was mixed use without residential, but now residential includes only artisan live workspace. Um, the recent updates that we made to the industrial uses last year um, added you know, a number of uses, but also added some new standards to the industrial zoning district. There is no minimum lot size in the zone. And in general, all of the residential uses except for the artisan live workspace are allowed. The next district, there's actually three that are all on this map. The, what, the first one I'm gonna talk about is the transportation district. And you can barely see it because it is essentially a line. It is the bikeway. The Minuteman bikeway is one of the primary elements of the transportation district along with uh, what we call the bus terminal in our zoning bylaw, which is actually the bus turnaround, and then open space uses. Um, and this, you know, this zone is not a, a meaningful zone, but it does have some special permit uses, um, and it does have some you know, requirements in terms of um, any development along the bikeway, which relates back to the Arlington Redevelopment Board's authority of permitting uh, specifically uses along the bikeway. Um, and then you see the uh, multi-use, which is um, actually limited to one property, which used to be the Sims Hospital um, that was turned into the Arlington 360 parcel. And in that particular zone, it was meant to be for larger scale development through that would be only permitted through an urban renewal plan. plan. Again, relating back to the, only, the, the one superpower of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, which is to create an urban renewal plan, of course, as adopted by town meeting with a lot of parameters and then approved by the Department of Housing and Community Development and usually spanning a period of time, typically 20 years. Um, so that parcel is completely covered, it's multiple parcels, but it's covered by an urban renewal plan and it's only tied to that one uh, zoning district and that, um, that is the only area in town with that uh, special classification. And then you can see in the lower right-hand corner in East Arlington, the planned unit development district. And this district is technically for large scale multi-use development, but the minimum lot area for this particular district is 200,000 square feet. So you'd really have to have something pretty grand in order to make something work in this particular zone. Um, that said, single and two family homes are allowed by right in the planned unit development district. And then lastly, oops, well, it's not displayed here, but lastly, actually, we have another district, which is the open space district. I think that it was shown earlier on in this uh, set of slides. And that is basically limited to all of the open space parcels that are governed uh, under the jurisdiction of the Parks and Rec Commission, the Conservation Commission, the Department of Conservation and Rec Recreation at the state level, and the Mass, uh, the, the MBTA. Um, and so with that, I think, I think I'm gonna hand it back to Laura. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, that is, uh, oh, um, then the, the last, um, or last speakers are um, Alex Bagnell and Steve Revelak, who are gonna take us on a stroll through Arlington. Thank you, Laura. So Steve and I would like to take some of these sometimes abstract discussion items and make them a little more uh, concrete, if you will, uh, oriented along a stroll down Mass Ave. We're going to pretend uh, I'm taking the family out to a movie. Um, so if we head out down Mass Ave, um, we come down to the Capitol Theater. I think a building that we all like. Uh, it anchors one end of our arts district. It has a number of delightful local businesses on the ground floor. Um, it includes a couple of places to eat. Um, it's a public assembly space, making for one mixed use. And then there are rental apartments above. 
uh, that seem relatively affordable. Um, I do note that it does not seem to have much parking. Um, and so I put to Steve, how likely would this project be to get built today? Something that anchors an entire area, brings people to the neighborhood, drives business and gives people a place to live. Okay, so hello, Alex. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Revelak. Um, so this is an example of a pre-existing non-conforming building. I believe it was built in the 19-teens. Um, Arlington did not adopt zoning until uh, the 20s. Um, so, you know, it was it was at a time when there were, the rules were simply different than what we have today. So on the left, I've got a little table um, and you'll see this on each of the, you'll see this a couple of times, but just to go over what some of the things in these are. Um, so there is a row for district. This corresponds to the map that the maps that we saw earlier. Uh, there is a row for lot area. Um, that's just simply the area of the lot. In this case, this, this parcel would not have a minimum lot area, but you know, it's, it's actually 21,810 square feet. There is a row for floor area. That's basically the floor space, the total floor space inside of the building, uh, subject to some rules. But you know the amount of it, it's floor space. Uh, the number of stories, and the F, this FAR it stands for floor area ratio, but it's basically the ratio of the floor area to the lot area. So in this case, divide thirty nine thousand four hundred eight by twenty one thousand eight hundred ten. Um, and the number you get is basically indicates how big a building is. Smaller numbers are smaller, bigger ones are bigger. Uh, and then there are the last three are the number of parking spaces, open space, which is sort of a term of art. It means that space on a parcel that doesn't have a building on it and it's not used for parking or traffic. You know, that's open space. So our bylaw requires some of that. And then uh, there's also, I put a row for rear yard setbacks just because uh, some of the property, some of the buildings we're looking at, they don't have, you know, they have rear yard setbacks and nothing else. So it's just a, you know, something, something we could look at. So in this case, the building is a little bit bigger than we'd allow it today. Um, it doesn't have any open space. Uh, the biggest difference, I think, between, you know, what, um, you know, what the rules were then and what the rules were now is uh, today we would require a lot more parking. So the just between the theater and the apartments in the building, um, we our zoning would ask for 302 spaces. Uh, they have five. So it's, you know, it's it's slightly under parked by today's standards, uh, although there are provisions for, you know, an applicant can ask for a reduction. So in this case, they might be able to go down to 75 if it's in the common interest and if the, you know, the, the special permitting granting, special permit granting authority, in this case, the ARB, um, chose to allow it. Uh, so there's also a requirement, would, today, it, there would be a requirement for a rear yard, uh, which, you know, was um, you know, really, really does, you really don't have, you um, in this in this configuration, so the if under you know under today's rules it would be um, you know it would have to be we would need a smaller building and we'd have to figure out something with the parking. So, so if, if we had to build two hundred and seventy eight parking spaces on that lot, what would that look like? Well, I happened I was kind of curious to one. The, the number surprised me. So I spent a little time just trying to figure out, you know, how you would lay out a parking lot. Um, it would have to be at least two stories. So I guess you could go into the ground and have a two story underground garage, or you could maybe do like a, a story underground and then a, you know, like ground level parking and then the businesses above that, or, you know, put everything above uh, although if you tried to put everything above, uh, we'd run into a height limit because um, in in this case, you could only three is so the stories row here has a five and a three. And that just represents that, you know, for a lot of our business districts, if you are near one of the single or two family zones, you have you can do less stories. But if you are farther away, you can do more stories um, in this case. You know, they have three stories and three would be, you know, the practical limit because of, you know, the two family district uh, located right next to them. 
Okay. So it seems unlikely this building would get permitted in its current form. Uh, I think I think that's correct. It, we, I don't believe the bylaw lets us grant uh, a reduction to five parking spaces for okay. this for this use. Excellent. Okay, so it turns out I ran out of cash and I need to go a little further down Mass Ave uh, to a building that from a pedestrian perspective kind of feels similar. It's got three stories to it, seems to have a decent amount of commercial space in it, but it seems much more recent. Uh, so, so could we build this one today? This one, I this one, I think so. It's it's pretty close. So in this case, it is a you know three stories, and again we have the same five versus three restriction. Um, the it's smaller than the maximum that we allowed. This is the floor area ratio, and you know they do have fewer parking spaces for this office. I you know I I tried working the numbers out. I got fifty three spaces. Uh, based on, you know, the, uh, you know, in an office building, you need so many square feet or one parking space per so many square feet. Um, but it's possible, again, they might, you know, one might be able to get a parking reduction or be granted a parking reduction. Uh, they actually have 35 spaces. And if you were to look at the, like in the map, uh, you could see, you know, you, it's difficult to, you wouldn't tell this, be, necessarily be able to see this from the street, but there is a, a fairly substantial parking lot in the back. Um, where these 35 spaces are. The little, the little white sections are like little landscaped areas. Uh, that's where the open space comes from. Um, this, I think, would be a little under, but there are, you know, there are exceptions that, you know, this might have been okay. And the rear yard, uh, rear, they've got, you know, more than enough rear yard. So I, I think this, this one would be, um, you know, it's, it's very close to being conforming. Okay, great. Okay, so now let's stroll back up and enjoy a bite to eat over at Town Tavern. Now here looks like a single story building. Surely this is a very minor use and, and we could build this? Well, it would be, if we built it today, this would be different. Um, so this is one of our older properties and I'm guessing I don't know this for sure but I'm guessing this was built at a time before we had off street parking requirements and um, perhaps open space requirements so from the map you could see that the you know the the building it's outlined in yellow it covers pretty much the entire parcel um you know it's only one story tall but you know there's not a doesn't have a rear yard I don't think it has any open space. It's it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly where the line is on, on the map. Um, and it's got no off-street parking. Now, for a restaurant, we normally require a parking space for every four seats, I think. In this case, without going into the restaurant and counting seats, um, I just sort of used another, you know, another parking requirement measurement in our, or another set of parking requirements in our bylaw just as sort of as a proxy proxy measurement. But uh, if you built a restaurant in a hotel, it would be one space per 400 square feet. So on the basis of you know that, I think this would come out to about nine spaces. So if you were to build this today, you would need a curb cut and you know some sort of off-street parking. And given how small that lot is, that might make that building almost uneconomic. Yeah. It, well, you would it's already have, kind of a small restaurant. It is a small. Yes. I mean, this is one of the um, this is one of the challenges of um, one of the challenges and one of the things I admire architects for their for the build for um, their, their ability to do is you have to take some of these constraints where in this case we need some parking, we need some open space. So how do we fit that in and still fit the building and make it all work? But I, I think it would be safe to say that it would look di it would look different than it does today. Okay. Okay. Well, now we've had a nice meal. We're feeling full, so we're going to have to walk this off uh, and maybe go check on the progress up at the high school. But on our way there, we're going to pass everybody's favorite Walgreens uh, with a massive parking lot in the front that I've never seen even half full, except maybe when they're selling Christmas trees. Um, Seems quite pedestrian unfriendly. It's set well back on the lot, um, not aligned with any of the neighboring buildings. Um, so we're, we're going to make our way across three or four rows of parking here to 
pick some things up. Now, is 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 this the sort of thing that our zoning is encouraging? Well, there's there's some caveats, but it's generally conforming. So I've seen I've actually seen an old picture of this building um, when it was a supermarket, and you know it's sort of like a you know, 70s era supermarket where there's a big parking lot in front and people, you know, drive in, they go shopping, they wheel the cart out to their car and then, you know, go on their way. Um, it is a big lot. Uh, it's, you know, not quite an acre and a half. Um, it's a one story building where we allow three. It's got a very low floor area ratio. Uh, they, they do have plenty of parking for this store. We would require 51 spaces based on the square footage. Uh, the parking lot has 84, assuming I counted correctly. Um, it has plenty of open space, you know, mostly in the form of, you know, little landscaped areas around the perimeter. Um, and also some of the sidewalk area up front. Um, the one place where it would be, you know, run into a challenge today is it doesn't have enough of a rear yard. So today this would need a rear yard of about 18 feet and change. And this one looks a bit <clears throat> between, it's between eight and nine feet. Um, so if so we scooched this thing 10 feet further away from the bike path, it would mm -hmm. be fully conforming. I think it would be fully conforming. Um, I th believe that, uh, you know, there's there's still an a, a discretionary approval step. So currently we encourage parking in the side or rear of buildings rather than in the front. So, um, you know, there would need to be, you know, you'd need to get, per I believe you would need to get permission to put the parking lot in front. Okay. Okay, well, we still haven't worked off that dinner. So we're gonna keep headed up to, toward Mass Ave. And now across from the high school, there seems to be a nice older looking apartment building. Um, and I think I even understand that some high school teachers live there. Um, and that seems awfully convenient to have a nice apartment building within walking distance of a large employer and on a good transit route. So how about this one? Well, it's a little, you know, there are some ways where it fits right in and there's, you know, there's a couple of you know, bumps that don't quite fit in. Uh, so this is a four story building, you know, although the bottom story is partially, you know, below grade, I th they're you know, at least walking up to it. Um, I think there's enough above grade that it, you know, we can call it a story. Um, I think this one would actually be a story too tall. So this gets back to those, you know, two tiered height restrictions where if you're near a re uh, single or two family zone, you have a, a, a lower, a lower story <clears throat> limit. So this one I think would be limited to three stories, although it is four. Um, the floor area ratio is a little higher than normal, but there's some, you know, the rules for figuring that out involve actually knowing how the different interior spaces are used. Um, and it's not information you can get from a property card, which is where I managed to, you know, put, put, pull this stuff together. Um, so it's probably okay with the floor area ratio. Uh, it's got plenty of open space, um, you know, definitely meets a requirement there. Again, the rear yard's a little bit short and we're short on parking, I believe. So because there's, um, you know, I, I took a walk behind this building and there's like a few parking spaces right up against the apartments. And there's a few on the other side, which I can't quite tell which go with which building. So I'm guessing this one has three or give or take. Um, but, you know, for the number of apartments they have, uh, it's 26 apartments. Uh, I believe, I'm assuming 16 of them are one bedroom and 10 or two bedrooms. Uh, the property card said it's got 36 bedrooms. I think they would need 33 spaces. Um, again, they uh, someone trying to build this today could ask for a reduction. Um, you know, the other challenge is, you know, finding the place for 33 spaces on the lot. Um, cause I mean, one of the nice things about this one is, you know, it's got a, it's got a really nice front lawn. Um, parking would be a, a bit of a challenge. And again, the, the, the rear, rear yard line is just a, a little shorter than it, uh, than it needs to be. So do you think our parking requirements are incent would be incentivizing this if this was coming up today to turn some of that lawn into parking? Yeah, I mean, it's because they're again, over on open space, but under on parking. 
Yeah, the other, you know, the other thing you have to, I, I think that would come into the picture is that, um, you know, we tr prefer to have parking, you know, not readily visible from the street. So, um, you know, basically not parking in the front yard. So you would might, there's probably, there might be room to put a parking lot in there, but you might also have to reorient the building in order to do it. Um, you know, maybe, so it's kind of on two, it's sort of L-shaped on two sides. You might have to go with, um, you know, the L-shape on two different sides and then yeah. have the space behind it. I haven't actually tried to do this, but, you know, that would be one way of uh, trying to think through it. Okay. So let's see, a little, just a little further down Mass Ave, there's the recently renovated Brookline Bank building. Again, this, this putting parking right on the street, which as you say, we're not that in favor of, but this is a another single story on building on Mass Ave with parking on the front and that's it, um, that again feels a little pedestrian unfriendly and more designed for access by cars than walking up to. But so, so this, this looks, except for the parking in the front, this looks fairly straightforward. This one I think is fairly straightforward. Uh, it is a one story building. It's well under the floor area ratio and they have enough parking. And as you can see, like these little, um, I guess it looks like little mulched planting areas and there's one near the parking lot. There's another one by the shrub. They've got plenty of open space. Um, you know, there's enough of a rear yard. And, you know, I, I think this one, I think this one would work. Now the parcel behind this is owned by the the same entity and some there are some rules that can come into play there but i don't know how that rear parcel is actually used so i didn't sort of i didn't consider it for the sake of this slide but yeah i think you could build this one today okay i, th I hmm. think it would be conforming okay well thank you very much okay all right back to you laura you're muted Thank you both very much. That was quite interesting. I thought so anyway. Um, we are now open for questions. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. If you, if you want to ask it to someone in particular, please let us know that. Otherwise, we will direct the questions um, as, as it seems to make sense to us. Um, and if we don't have any questions, then you can go home. Well, you're probably already home, but you can go about your business. Um, um, we'll give it a few minutes to see if anybody wants to throw anything into the chat. Comments? Laura, there, Laura, there was a question in the chat. Um, I received it. I'm not sure if anyone else did, but asking for a clearer explanation or an example of an overlay district, um, just to try to understand what the differences between the base zoning and then an overlay zoning. Um, Amy, did you want to try to take that? Because I think that you had brought that up in your presentation. Sure. I think it most often is used where you might want to allow like a mixed use district or an area where you have slightly denser housing, um, where you want it to cover sort of part of a downtown, but not necessarily aligning with the existing downtown zone. So you might have like a business district, but you, if if you wanted to change the zoning neatly with the business district, you wouldn't need an overlay, but you might decide that half of the business district should get these special requirements or, or allowances. Um, so you just create an overlay instead of cutting up the old district, like that would be to do it without an overlay would be to cut cut it up into two districts um, an overlay would just be, and, and then the overlay might extend, for example, from a business district, a block back into the residential district, um, or it could be often it's used, an overlay might be used for like um, open space residential design cluster zoning, where say like in a place like Hamilton, uh, where you have a, residential district where you have one acre lot size requirements and a residential district where you have two acre lot size requirements, you might put an overlay that sort of goes around both those areas saying that if you do a residential subdivision, you can cluster the units and protect some of the district as open space, but you're not just like rewrite, it might be through parts of those instead of exactly with it. 
Thank you. Um, we have oh, we have a question from um, Jennifer Latowski about the process for changing zoning. And I wonder, Rachel, if you would take that since the ARB is um, very key in that process. Sure, I'm actually going to um, defer that one to uh, Jennifer Rate because she works with a lot of um, members of the of the public when they uh, have uh, questions such as this, whether it's in a small way or in a in a larger way as well. Just simply how to go about the process. Yes, that was the question. Yeah, I mean the the process varies. Um, some. People are participating in town committees, you know, where we're actively talking about uh, zoning or uh, master planning or some element of uh, community development that's happening. Um, so they're they're more actively engaged, and they might have a proposal. They might talk about it with the committee. Um, other people who are citizen petitioners sometimes have their own ideas and you know uh, want to develop a proposal and uh, shop it around to their neighbors or other people. Um, there's a lot of different ways that zoning can be proposed uh, for amendments, um, including, of, call, of course, also by the redevelopment board itself um, as part of, you know, to implement our master plan or other plans that we have in place. The board actually has on the town's website a whole process that outlines, uh, you know, sort of when we like to be part of those different processes, whether it's coming through citizen petition or even through the, re uh, the redevelopment board. And um, typically, we want to work with petitioners as early as possible. You know, so the, the town meeting that we're about to have later this month, um, and it will end at some point in May, we start thinking about the next season uh, of planning for town meeting soon thereafter. So if you start to have an idea about a zoning amendment, we'd like to start talking with you about it or talking with people about it either at our board meetings, um, leading into that town meeting, so that people can be ready to file warrant articles, which is always the, the last uh, Friday of January before the town meeting um, in that following uh, annual town meeting in April. Um, so the process can be varied, but, and it might come from you know, different places. Um, typically it starts with a conversation with staff or the board, but it could also be independent of those two. Um, but eventually it does go to the redevelopment board goes through a public hearing process where we actually just wrapped up our public hearings for the zoning warrant articles for annual town meeting. But Thursday night, we're having our warrant article hearings for special town meeting. So if you feel like you were left out of that process, you can still <laughs> attend on Thursday night uh, for special town meeting. But I, I guess in, in conclusion, there's a lot of ways to get involved. If you want to propose a zoning amendment or talk with staff or talk with the board or talk with your neighbors about it, and I think all of those work um, equally well and efficiently. Um, but again, the board does have sort of a process timeline to orient people. And we can maybe, I, I know that materials will eventually be posted for this um, forum and as well as the presentations. And so we can also make sure that that process timeline is posted and shared, if that works, Laura. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Grant Cook asks, how much of the town approximately is um, actually legal by today's zoning? Do you know, do you have any idea, Jenny? I, not off the top of my head, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> not how many non-conforming parcels we have. I mean, we have done studies of some residential parcels, but across all zoning districts, I'm not sure I have the number right off the top of my head. Maybe either Steve or Kelly a little bit of a, you know, best guess potentially. Well, this is Steve um, and I apologize. Um, Zoom seems to think it, I, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Zoom thinks it does and I no, am. No, you're not. Oh, okay. And uh, of course I'm not seeing any of you, but um, the, it's actually, pr the, the term is pre-existing non-conforming uh, with basically that means there was <laughs> something that was built um, in the past when the rules were different. And, you know, generally when the, you know, when there is a zoning change, the, you know, the existing structures are exempt from that unless, you know, you want to try to, you know, alter or replace them. Um, in terms of the number of pre-existing non-conforming buildings, um, I have, you know, one, it would be difficult to put a percentage on it, but, simply based on the you know the fact that 
most of ta most of our parcels are single and two family homes. We have a 6,000 square foot minimum lot size and a lot of lots, you know, particularly in certain areas of town are smaller than that. Um, you know, I suspect it's less than half, but there are, a, I think there are a significant number of pre-existing non-conforming uh, buildings in town. Thank you. Thank Not you. Glad that, you know, it's easier to measure this for the R0 or the R1 zoning district or the R2 zoning district. Um, it's much more difficult to measure this for the business district where you have much very much more variable um, dimensional requirements for zoning. Um, but we do know that I think roughly um, just under 20% of parcels in the R2, in the R0 zoning district are non-conforming. And then um, about 40 to 45% of the parcels in the R1 district are non-conforming. And that, that's really just based on the lots. That's not based on the buildings on them. That's just if the lot is large enough to comply with the minimum lot size and if the frontage is sufficient per the zoning uh, dimensional requirements. But it does vary depending on the zoning district. Um. Elizabeth Dre has a question about an affordable housing overlay. I keep hearing that Cambridge has one, but I'm unclear on what that means or if it is something to consider here. Do you know anything about that, Amy? I, yeah, so that um, allows development of multifamily housing by right in areas where you otherwise wouldn't be allowed to do it as long as the units are affordable. Um, so it gives kind of an advantage to affordable housing developers um, to be able to do that. Whereas if it allowed multifamily house any type- Are you of expecting a delivery? Uh, uh, Can you go on mute, please? Thank you. Any type of multifamily housing development, um, then like often private sector developments like market rate developers would be able to outbid the affordable housing developers. So it gives the affordable housing developers an advantage. And a lot of people have been concerned that um, housing coming in is so expensive. Um, and this is allowing um, really specifically targeted affordable housing to be built in areas where it had never been allowed. Thank you. Um, and I, have they actually passed that? Do you know if they, have they adopted that or um, they're just still considering it? Yeah, that has been adopted. It has been adopted. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Wynell Evans has an, a question um, or a comment. The Capitol Block is frequently used as, as an example of a much loved structure that couldn't be built today. If the plans for new mixed use buildings were designed with the style and flair and great materials and detailing of the Capitol Block, people might feel differently about them. Instead, we get bland generic designs that would fit into Malden Center ooh, or really any place at all. Um, uh, excuse me, just one second. Um, can Ruth Ellen Jacobs asks, can the town zoning board stop a homeowner or developer from tearing down a small house or replacing it with a bigger one? Um, Jenny, do you want to talk about that? The answer is not necessarily no, um, and typically not at all. Um, usually that type of development and construction is allowed by right, but it also kind of depends upon what they're trying to do with the new the newly constructed dwelling. So if that newly constructed dwelling is expanding a nonconformity or the lot itself has nonconformities, then it might need to be uh, have a special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it gets stopped. It means that it goes through a public review process, as I think, Laura, you were noting. Um, you know, by right versus special permit. Most of that type of uh, construction that happens in Arlington happens by right, which means that somebody can go to the inspectional services department and pull a building permit as opposed to needing a building permit and a special permit. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Latowski has a uh, follow up question from her original question about um, zoning changes. And she's asking, do all zoning changes then go to town meeting for approval or only certain types? And I think the answer to that is they all go to town meeting. Any zoning change needs to go to town meeting. Um, Mr. Wilmer. Um, 
Christopher Wilbur has asked, how would you describe a typical negotiation process with zoning board to get something approved that doesn't meet regulations exactly? Um, so I, I can talk a little bit to, to that if right, um, thank you. You know, specifically to the way that that works with the redevelopment board, which are um, the larger developments and the, the developments in the business districts. So we work very closely. Well, I, I would say that first, the um, a developer or any applicant who has a um, has a uh, has a project that they are looking to propose that does not meet the current regulations works very closely with the planning department first. Um, and they work to help them identify strategies in order to bring their property into compliance or to um, develop a property that meets the goals of the, the intent of the zoning bylaw as well as our, our master plan. It then comes in front of the redevelopment board and we work with them. There are there are several different um, items built into the zoning bylaw that allow us to make exceptions to certain regulations um, in exchange for public amenities or other types of elements um, that a, a developer or a property owner might be able to bring to um, bring to their property. And that's again in in the the business districts or in the industrial districts. So for example, um, Steve talked a little bit about parking requirements. If um, an owner feels that they do not have the space on their site for um, what the bylaw requires in terms of parking, there are strategies that we can use um, that help mitigate traffic that we can suggest that a, um, a project owner use um, in exchange for reduction of, of parking, just as one example. Um, and Steve, perhaps you could talk a little bit about how the Zoning Board of Appeals works together with um, applicants for residential properties. Well, for a lot of the, um, you know, I, I was a former Zoning Board of Appeals member. Uh, a lot of the cases that come before the ZBA are for special permits are generally uh, because you know, someone owns a non-conforming property and wants to do something with it. A common example is uh, putting a front porch on that extends into the, you know, what would normally be the front yard or adding a dormer on uh, a property without open space. So there is a set of, you know, criteria. Uh, if you go to inspectional services, uh, there is a, you know, basically a, a questionnaire in the form of a special permit application where it's a set of, um, qualitative things that you uh, you need to do. Some portions of the bylaw are more specific about the criteria, but basically what we, you know, what we do, what the ZBA does is similar in the sense that, um, you know, there are allowances or not allowances, it's there's criteria for issuing a special permit or for making a decision. And, you know, you try to Read the read the criteria and apply it to the case that's before you. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Robin Bergman. How would Arlington be required to build near transit hubs and where? This pro this question I think refers to the new um, state uh, law known as Housing Choice, which requires communities that are served by the MBTA to have a certain um, increased density near transit hubs. Um, I, what, I wonder if um, you, Jenny, might be able to explain where the town is in terms of those um, in relation to that, the housing choice legislation. Sure, um, thanks, Laura. Um, the MBTA communities requirement that is that you're referencing is uh, currently being, uh, the guidelines are being developed by the, Depart the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development. They issued draft guidelines um, and the comment period for those guidelines actually closed on March 31st. And they will be eventually finalizing those guidelines and issuing them. And so we're, we're evaluating what it means. We have evaluated what that might mean for Arlington. We've also made a presentation to the redevelopment board and to the select board um, sort of outlining our understanding of the draft guidelines and the requirements and what it might look like in Arlington. And so anybody who's interested in viewing 
um, those presentations, we we can actually, again, I think maybe send something around as a follow up to this, because I, I won't make people go into Nova's agenda, so forget that, um, <laughs> to, to, to navigate and find the presentation. But um, we, we are looking at it, we're trying to understand it. It, it. The most important part is it's a requirement, but the guidelines are being developed, so we're still learning what it might mean and what it might look like. And our best understanding is that it probably will will mostly apply to the area uh, around alewife but may also depending upon the acreage and the expansiveness of it might also apply to other areas as well so that we can uh, you know basically reach the capacity goals and again that's that's under the current draft guidelines so we're still sort of evaluating what that might mean um, when we do know what the actual guidelines will look like then we will be having a very broad public engagement process to fully vet it and fully understand uh, what it might mean and get uh, community input along the way. So we're learning, um, there is a presentation, more to come. Thanks. Thank you. I know it's it's complicated and there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, Michelle Nathan asks the question, what is the history up to today, how residents feel, think, act regarding zoning? I'm not sure I understand that question entirely. Um, does anybody want to take a crack at that? Maybe Amy. Do, Amy, do you have any thoughts? How Arlington residents feel about zoning? Yes, I believe. Okay. Well, I believe that would be the yeah, question. Jenny, <laughs> maybe answer that question. Uh, but I, I would just say that um, zoning is a tool for managing growth in a community and in a region. Um, I feel that it's often used just to suppress growth. Um, and then also to like manage it very tightly in certain areas. Um, and I'd like to see it used a little bit more proactively to think that it, we need as a region to build more housing, uh, to be thinking about where should we allow that and to revise the zoning to create some space capacity um, for, for more building to happen in a predictable way. Um, and even if the zoning is by right, uh, the community can have the input to say about like where that is, how we prepare for it, um, and what kind of uh, w things we'd like to see in terms of a site plan review and development that we feel like fits in with the community and to write the regulations in a way that you would sort of get your preferable type of development as the like easiest path, the path of least resistance for developers. Mm hmm. Interesting answer. Um, Steve, I'm going to give you this question. Beth Malafchik asks, why is non-conforming bad? And, and I think also maybe she's getting at what does it mean, you know, for the community if there's so, a lot of non-conforming properties. So non-conforming isn't necessarily bad. It just means that, you know, some something got built at one point in time and sometime later the rules changed um one example that um you know comes up it came up often in my tenure on the zoning board of appeals was you know that were things that involved open space so prior to 1975 the uh, there were no open space requirements in our zoning bylaw and in 1975 we added them so the, due to the nature of that requirement um you know all those build it you know any parcel without open space is non-conforming uh any parcel that's on a lot that's too small is non-conforming any lot that's on a parcel with or any house that's on a parcel without enough frontage is conforming so what the non -con the state zoning act um has a set of provisions called vested rights it basically you know, kind of preserves your right to, you know, maintain the building and maintain how you're using it. Um, but if you need to change it, there's, you know, there's, there's basically a, there's basically extra stuff involved in the form of a special permit hearing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we have a question um from celia kent given that zoning regulations do not necessarily result in buildings that we view as attractive 
or contributing to the pedestrian experience, does the town have design guidelines or provide design advisory services for renovation or new development projects? Um, Jenny, could you answer that? Certainly. Um, so, well, we actually do for, um, <laughs> For the single and two families um, that get built in town, there's it's it is a an advisory process. That was a good word to use, because it is basically design guidelines and the residential design guidelines, which was actually a project led by Kelly Lanima, um, here on the Zoom. Um, that project uh, basically resulted in this set of very excellent design guidelines that basically say these are things that we we would prefer based upon. The neighborhood that uh, you know a property might be located in, and these are things that we might discourage. It is used by town staff, the including the inspectional services department, and then of course uh, the zoning board of appeals, who predominantly uh, reviews that type of dwelling and use, uh, the single and two families. For other types of projects uh, subject to the redevelopment board's review, they all undergo design review by the redevelopment board. And there are also a set of uh, design standards that we currently have that were developed in 2015 during the Arlington master plan process. Those design standards, however, we have found to be a little out of step with the type of development that we've actually seen. Um, so we are hoping that we'll be able to update those design standards to apply much more uh, directly to the commercial corridors. Those design standards are actually for the commercial corridors, the bikeway, um, and the Mill Brook corridor. So it's a, little, it's a little more expansive than just commercial areas. Since last year, we also developed design standards for the industrial zones. We are now much more focused on the commercial areas. So basically we have some design guidelines for single and two families. We have commercial design standards. We're looking to update them. And we also have standards for the industrial zones. So we're pretty well covered and everything else is covered by the redevelopment board. Um, uh, for Amy Dane, Mark Rosenthal has a question. Could you explain the different categories of affordable housing and why are affordable units built under 40B not required to be permanently affordable? Ooh, <laughs> there are many different programs for building affordable housing and different rules and different programs. And there are certain rules if you're going to build a development under 4DB, uh, what the affordable units need to be like uh, affordable to people at what levels of income. And uh, <laughs> for every program, or even if you're just an affordable housing developer who wants to build deed restricted affordable housing under without a like specific guideline, you can make decisions about how long is it deed rest restricted? Is it in per perpetuity? Is it 30 years? Is it affordable to people making 30% of area median income? Are your units to 60% of area median income affordable or 100% of area median income? All sorts of uh, decision points on affordable housing. And that's also decision points for people writing inclusionary zoning bylaws, what you're gonna require. Um, for the affordable units. With 40B, uh, it says that I think 20% of the units need to be affordable to people making 60% um, of area median income, I believe. But then if you're, or you could do 25% of the units, a quarter of your units affordable at 80% of area median income so that the rents are just like a little bit higher on those. So there are just sort of all sorts of factors and considerations considering what the program is. Um, and I know it is an issue for units that were built with like a 30 year deed restriction, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and then those end and we lose affordable housing in the region and need to like pay the owners to ex extend that. Um, but I don't know if that answers your, your question and that 40B is just one sort of route towards development of affordable housing. Thank you. Um, um, I think we'll just take one or two more. Um, it's getting to be 830. Um, select board member Len Diggins asks about uh, what percentage of underutilized lots are there, especially in the business district. In other words, where we could be building more, more stories or, or um, greater lot coverage. Um, let's see, uh, do, do you, Jenny or Kelly have a, have a, um, Yes. 
I'll, I'll just start by saying I think underutilized is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Um, so I'll uh, I'll start there. You know, I think I'm not. I, I if underutilized means is it is is it built out to its current zoning? Uh, not many of our parcels are necessarily built out completely to their current zoning. Or as we just walked through the maps and uh, the use table and everything else, we learned that a lot of things are actually non-conforming and you can't really build them the way that they look today if you were to rebuild them again. So underutilized, I think, is sort of an interesting word to use. I think really most of the properties in Arlington along the main corridors are what we consider to be uh, in the area for redevelopment. And that is under the purview and jurisdiction of the Arlington Redevelopment Board just for that reason. Um, it doesn't mean that they're underutilized in their current use or status. It just means that those are areas that would be redeveloped because they're already developed with something else. That said, the B4 district, the zoning district that has a lot of automotive oriented uses is probably the district that has the most underutilized parcels. Um, and so there's basically, I think you could probably count up 15, 20 parcels that are in that particular zoning district and they span Mass Ave, Broadway. I think maybe that's it. Um, just uh, looking back in my, uh, thinking about that map, that, that particular layer. Um, so it's not that many parcels are necessarily underutilized. But again, it's in the eye of the beholder. There might be other types of properties that are just a parking lot. And somebody might say, well, that might be, you know, a good opportunity for redevelopment, but there's nothing actually developed there right now. So underutilized, I think, is an interesting way of looking at it. But along the main corridors, we think of that area as being the area for redevelopment. Um, and it could be something different. It could be something that could be built out differently. And then there could be the parcels that only have parking on them, um, which would be considered, I would think, underutilized specifically. For, for the final question, there's a couple of people who offered opinions and questions about the appearance of what's built today. Um, and I think, I think what they're saying is, even though we have design guidelines, even though we have this board review process, why are the why are the buildings coming out um, either looking very um, similar or very boxy or for whatever reason um, not uh, like the capital block let's just say and I wonder if Rachel or Jennifer or anyone else can offer an opinion about what what are the limitations of what the town can do in terms of um, what what a development looks like. Uh, I can start and then maybe um, Jenny can chime in. I think that this is a, a challenging question um, or it's a challenging process for us as a board and the, the planning department as well often when we're working together with um, with project owners and, and developers. Um, because we do not have any binding design guidelines, it is a challenge for the redevelopment board to specify a particular architectural style or materials um, because they are not currently required by the town um, for any specific um, district or, 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 or block or building typology. Um, we work very hard to ensure that each project um, is improved to the best of the ability that the board um, how far we, we, we work very hard to understand how far we're able to push um, the, uh, the means and the, um, the ability of the developer to, to work within their, their budget, their, um, their uh, design team's um, ability, and the, um, the bounds of the, the, the project. So, um, there's obviously a budgetary, um, uh, there are budgetary elements in terms of ensuring that a project can, can go forward that we need to take into account. There are um, elements of um, conforming with the zoning requirements that we need to take into account. And um, we work a lot with trying to provide uh, precedent examples that we think would be helpful for the project development team to, um, to reference. 
but we don't design their buildings for them. So there's there's a limit to um, what we can, um, how far we can push them short of literally taking pen to paper and um, creating a, a, a new design uh, for the team. Jenny, I'm not sure if you have anything further to, to add to that. To, uh, to say that, you know, the as part of the redevelopment board and even the zoning board of appeals uh, review processes for the special permit, which is a discretionary review. And each board has, you know, members who have design backgrounds and often bring that background as part to the review process. Staff also have uh, capabilities with design. Um, we, we do our very best, I would say, but because those are discretionary special permitting processes that include pu public hearings, there are actually occasions where we hear from neighbors or other people who live in Arlington who, who actually provide very good um, design suggestions and ideas. And so that that is one bonus of a public hearing process is getting to hear the, the positive constructive um, suggestions to improve design. One, one thing comes to mind in a, in a current special permit that is being reviewed, where some suggestions for different facades, um, different types of materials were suggested as part of you know, commentary. And those are the things that the board can you know, consider and think about and also potentially suggest to the applicant to make changes. So the, I think it's a, the, the other part to it is it's an iterative process, meaning that we often see things in one shape or form and you know, slowly try to work with an applicant to make it better and, and get as to Rachel's point as far as we possibly can in that process, so. Thank you. And, and just also to, to make the point that zoning is not a design process, really. It's, it's, a, it's a set of guidelines. And if you fit into those guidelines, then you, you basically can build. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming and hanging in. I think, I think at one point I saw that there were about 90 people on this, on this Zoom, which is pretty impressive on such an um, interesting topic. Um, and I really want to thank all of the speakers, Alex Bagnall, Amy Dane, Jennifer Raitt, Steve Revelak, and Rachel Zembry for sharing their wisdom with us. And um, I hope you found this interesting and um, helpful in some way. Have a nice evening. Uh, just want to add that if you have additional questions, there's a few places that you can send them. Um, the uh, Rachel Zembray or anybody on the ARB is available to answer questions. Um, they're busy, but but they they've offered. <laughs> um, anybody on the ZBA, and I'm actually I'm going to Christian Klein. I saw on here, so I'm going to call. He's the chair of the ZBA. Um, but but you can send if it's about an individual property, you can send something there. Uh, the planning department is also available. Uh, Steve Revelak has kindly, because he's worn hats both at ARB and at ZBA, has kindly offered to um, be maybe the first line of, of questions uh, if, if you have them. So um, I know zoning is really complicated. I hope we've done a good job at, at somewhat demystifying it, but, um, but, but I know that this is a really complicated thing. And so you might come up with a question later that you, you didn't think of yet tonight. So I encourage you to use those resources. And again, thank you everyone for your, your help.